A Splash of Red, The Life and Art of Horace Pippin, written by Jen Bryant, illustrated by Melissa Sweet. On February 22, 1888, the town of Westchester, Pennsylvania celebrated a holiday. That day, in the same town, Daniel and Christine Pippin celebrated the birth of their son, Horace. Horace grew fast, so fast that his mother could barely keep up with the mending. He'll be a giant some day, the neighbors would say. Grandma Pippin smiled at Horace's long legs and big hands. She figured the neighbors were right. Grandma's hands were big too, rough and scarred from her slave days in Virginia, but they were just fine for giving Horace hugs. The biggest part of you, she told him, is inside where no one can see. When Horace was three years old, the Pippins moved to Goshen, New York, and as the family grew larger, everyone helped out. Horace put his big hands to work. He fetched flour for his mother. He sorted laundry with his sisters. He played with his baby brother. He held the horse while the driver delivered milk. At night, he piled wood for the stove and arranged dominoes so his grandmother could play. Then, if he could find a scrap of paper and a piece of charcoal, he drew pictures of what he'd seen that day. Horace loved to draw. He loved the feel of the charcoal as it slid across the floor. He loved looking at something in the room and making it come alive again in front of him. He loved thinking about a friend or a pet and then drawing them from the picture in his mind. At school, he sat quietly at his desk, but his big hands were always busy. Make a picture for us, Horace, his classmate said, and Horace did. His pictures made people happy, except when he made some next to his spelling list. That made the teacher mad. But Horace couldn't stop drawing. One day, Horace saw a funny face in a magazine. Draw me and win a prize, it said underneath. Horace drew the face and sent it off. A few weeks later, a package arrived. Inside, Horace found colored pencils, a pair of brushes, and a box of paints. Congratulations, said the note. Horace had won his first real art supplies. Paint a picture for us, Horace, his sisters cried, and Horace did. He painted everyday scenes in natural colors, and then he added a splash of red. Horace was in the eighth grade when his father left for good. The family needed money, so Horace quit school and went to work. For several years, Horace's big hands were always busy, stacking grain sacks at a feed store, shoveling coal at a rail yard, mending fences on a farm, carrying luggage at a hotel, making breaks in an iron factory, packing oil paintings into large wooden crates. Looking at these made Horace remember winning the art contest and how proud he'd been how he'd loved those colored pencils, those brushes, and his first real box of paints. Horace was a big man now with big responsibilities. Still, he loved drawing as much as he always had. He used charcoal, broken pencils, whatever he could find. Make a picture for us, Horace, the other workers said, and Horace did. Far across the ocean, a terrible war had begun. Horace's big heart wanted to help. He joined the army, and sailed away. In France, Horace and his regiment dug deep trenches for protection. There were no blankets or beds. It was always wet and cold and dark. I have not seen the sun in more than a month, Horace wrote. He wrapped his big hands around a rifle. Planes droned overhead. Shells exploded. Gunfire rattled through the night. If the fighting stopped for a while, Horace put down his gun and picked up a pencil. Make a picture for us, Horace, his soldier friends pleaded, and Horace did. He filled his notebooks one by one. One day, he climbed to the top of the trench. A shot rang out. Horace felt pain in his shoulder. He was hit. Many hours passed before help came. Horace was glad to be alive, but the bullet had badly damaged his right arm. When it healed, he couldn't lift or move it the way he used to. And now when someone said, make a picture for us, Horace, Horace could not. 
After the war, Horace came back to the United States and met Jenny Wade. Jenny was a hard worker. She loved to cook. Horace was a hard worker too, and he loved to eat. It was a good match. They married and settled down in Westchester. Horace was 32 years old, as big and strong as ever, but because of his injured arm, he couldn't find a job. How much can you lift? The hiring boss asked, and that was the end of that. So Horace did what he could. He organized a Boy Scout troop. He umpired baseball games. He took the neighbor's children fishing. When Jenny started a laundry business, Horace delivered the clean clothes. And as he walked along the streets of Westchester, his fingers itched to draw all the colors and textures he saw. Lacy white curtains billowing in the windows, a splash of red geraniums blooming on a step, a yellow cat sprinting down an alley, deep green vines spiraling up a wall. At night, his old home in Goshen, his grandmother's slave days, and the Bible story she told him made pictures in his mind. He longed to draw them too, but how? His right arm was weak and painful to lift. The iron poker stood by the fire, straight and tall as a soldier. Could he? With his left hand, he grasped his right wrist. He thrust the poker into the flames until it glowed red hot. Using his good arm to move the hurt one, he scorched lines into wood. Make a picture for us, Horace, the neighbor said, and Horace did. With practice, his arm grew stronger, his hand steadier. Maybe now, he told Jenny, I can try painting. There was no money for art supplies, so Horace used an old brush and leftover house paint he found in the alleys. For a canvas, he used a clean piece of cloth. Every day and late into the night, Horace worked on his painting. He used gray, black, and white, the somber colors of war. Here and there, he added a splash of red. He used 100 layers of paint. He decorated the frame with tiny sculptures. Three years later, he finished. Now, as he delivered laundry or fished in the river, new ideas came, but he didn't paint them right away. Before he reached for a brush, Horace painted each new scene in his head. He painted the milkman in his wagon, women working in the kitchen, children playing games in the yard, cotton fields and log cabins, John Brown and Abraham Lincoln, war scenes and Bible tales, men singing on the corner, Horace hung his paintings in a shoe store window. Five dollars each, said the sign. He hung others in a restaurant. He even traded one for a haircut. People admired Horace's paintings, but no one bought them. Then, the president of a local artist club saw Horace's pictures. He told his friend, the famous painter N.C. Wyeth, to come see them too. Wyeth agreed. Horace's paintings were good, very good. Do you have more? The men asked. Horace showed them his work. He held his breath as they looked and talked. Finally, they said, you should have your own art show, a one-man exhibition right here in Westchester. Horace could hardly believe it. He shook hands with the men, and when they left, he celebrated with Jenny. People came from all around to see Horace's paintings. Magazines wrote articles, reporters took photos, an art dealer told Horace he would help him sell his work. More than 40 years had passed since Horace won his first box of paints. Now, at last, everyone knew he was an artist. Horace became famous. His paintings hung in big city galleries. Museums displayed them. Collectors admired them. Movie stars bought them. Once again, Horace's big hands were always busy. And if you stood outside his house, late at night, you might see him leaning towards his easel his left hand holding up his right, painting the pictures in his mind. All right, so we just finished reading the story about Horace Pippin called A Splash of Red, and that is in reference to even his pictures where he had a lot of black and white, he liked to put a little red in there. Um, and so I thought today it would be fun, we're gonna use really simple materials. So I just have um, a brown piece of construction paper. You could use newsprint. You can use white copy paper if you wanted. And we're gonna draw with these uh, graphites. These happen to be by uh, Lyra out of Germany. But basically it's like a big piece of pencil lead. It's, it's graphite. And this is probably the closest thing without using real charcoal. We don't wanna 
Um, we're not going to use charcoal today because it's kind of messy. But when Horace first started drawing, he just would get charcoal from the fireplace or even like a burnt stick from the fireplace to draw with. And remember he liked to draw things that he saw every day. So when he was out walking around or working and he would see everyday life, those were the things that he liked to make his art from. So today we've got our simple kind of basic materials and I want you to think of something that you that you see every day, something that's very familiar to you. So um, this is when we talk a lot also about our paper, vertical or horizontal. I'm going to turn my horizontal and I know one of the things that he drew were um, log cabins or, or houses, things from his from Bible stories or um, from his neighborhood. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a house and I'm going to start off with um, kind of making a little line here of where my house is going to sit. So this is going to be kind of the in front of the house, the ground. That could be the sky. I'm, I'm not going to do color with mine right now. I, if I wanted, I could go back and add color later. But I want, to, I want to try something for you to, I want you to try this too. So when he first started off when he was a younger artist um, and he drew with his right hand, he was right handed. And then later when he was injured, he could not draw. He did not have enough muscle control in that hand to, to draw with it freely. And so he literally had to hold his hand, um, hold his arm with the other hand so that he could have the strength to draw. But another way you can kind of try that to see what it would feel like, and you can do this two different ways. You can draw one in the beginning of your house. So if I was going to draw a house, I'm doing, I'm right handed too. So I'm going to start this. Here's my house. Here's the door. Um, do my roof. windows. Maybe this is a two-story house. Maybe there's windows up here. So I'm just doing the basic outlines of a house. You could go back and do more details and things later. Once your house is done, your house isn't just standing there by itself. What are some of the little details that you notice, like maybe the shingles on your roof. Maybe they look like little squares. Maybe you have a fireplace. Um, maybe there's, let's talk about planting. Maybe you have a tree outside your house. These are supposed to be leaves. <laughs> maybe you have a sidewalk that comes down and maybe you have um, some bushes in front of your house. Okay, that's all with my right hand. All right, get the idea. Let's flip this over. This is what I want to try. What if I tried with my left hand? Some people can draw really well with both hands, but I think this is a good, and it doesn't, you don't have to do a house, because remember, you can do anything from everyday life. Oh, it's hard to draw a straight line with your non-dominant hand. I'm trying to draw kind of the same house. But it gives you some empathy for what it's like for someone who's having to adapt. That's, that's what I'm finding to be the hardest, is to keep my lines straight. They, it's not as easy as you would think. I kind of slow down. So I want you to try to draw, do your drawing, once with your dominant hand. And if you're left-handed, you're going to start with your left hand first and then try with your right hand. It's much slower going. I can't draw as fast as I did with the other hand. It also helps if you kind of hold the paper down with that other hand. Um, same thing if I was going to do the details on the roof, try to get those lines to do the shingles. I'm not going to finish the whole drawing, but you can tell the difference. Look at that house. Look at that house. 
All right, so try that out. Try it once with your dominant hand and then try, flip it over and try it with the other hand and good luck.